Oskar Dijkstra is one of the pioneers of computer software. He was born in Holland, studied theoretical physics there, and after World War II, he started playing around with some of the very first computers. He had a choice, devote his life to theoretical physics or to programming computers. He chose programming. I had the feeling that um, programming was a greater intellectual challenge. How many physicists agreed with you? <laughs> None of them, I think. In physics, Dijkstra says, you always have an excuse for answers that turn out to be wrong. The natural universe is just too complex. In the case of programming, uh, if it doesn't work, there is no excuse. You have made the mess yourself. And often, as Dijkstra and others began creating the first software, it was a mess. Computers were always crashing. By 1968, some of the leading computer scientists in the world met in Germany and coined the term the software crisis. Software, they announced, was rapidly becoming the weakest, most fragile part of the whole computing industry. Dijkstra was at that meeting. I remember that I was very excited, wrote a very excited letter to my parents uh, that uh, at last it was admitted that it was difficult, so now something could be done about it. The computer industry has tried to do something about it ever since, but the software crisis just won't go away. It's All Things Considered. I'm No Adams. AT&T engineers have found the problem that triggered the phone company's worst breakdown yesterday. Yesterday, in this case, was January 15, 1990. It's a bug in the computer software that controls the company's long-distance service. An estimated 50 million calls went nowhere, causing major disruptions for airlines, hotels, stock traders, and anybody else who depends on the phone. This sort of failure, software that collapses for mysterious reasons, is Edsger Dijkstra's nightmare. Not only does it still happen, software has become so important, the consequences of this sort of failure keep growing. Also, as software takes on new jobs, it's become more complicated. That increases the chances something can go wrong. Take the story of the nation's air traffic control software. In a federal aviation center near Leesburg, Virginia, air traffic controllers sit in front of glowing green screens, tracking jetliners through the sky. It's software that turns the radar echoes from the sky into a picture on the screen. And this particular software was created to run this particular computer system. In fact, it will only run on these 20-year-old computers. And although the computer program itself doesn't wear out, James Kidd, who works here, says the computers do. These frequently don't work anymore. This, because it's 1960s technology, doesn't have any replacement parts for it. The only way we can actually fix these things is to cannibalize other ones. So when this breaks, we have to cannibalize something else someplace else to put it inside of this. And when you eventually run out of cannibalization, you're dead in the water. The Federal Aviation Administration started trying a decade ago to replace this archaic computer system. The key was software. The FAA wanted a new system to do basically what the old software already did, but the new software was supposed to run on standard, widely used computers. That's so the FAA can buy new, faster computers in the future and still run the same software. Just like you still use the same word processing software when you switch to a more powerful PC. But neither the FAA nor the company that won the contract, IBM, could resist the temptation to keep asking their software developers to add new features, like having the screens display more and more information, except that each reworking of the system created new problems, new bugs that caused the whole system to crash. Fixing one set of bugs introduced different ones. The software was supposed to cost four and a half billion dollars. Last year, cost estimates rose to $7 billion, and the FAA decided to cancel large parts of it. A congressional committee hauled everybody involved in the debacle up to Capitol Hill for a public tongue lashing. Congressman Greg Laughlin of Texas focused his anger on IBM, which had just sold the division working on this project for a billion and a half dollars. We're sitting here talking about dollars, and I don't understand any of the computers, I don't understand any of the engineering, but I understand that we got a system that's out of whack, and one company is able to drive a billion and a half dollars for, for doing a poor job. When people in the software business tell this story, they act like they've seen it all before, and they have. David Fisher of the Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology says, according to one study, of all the major software projects that private companies and the government start, between 70 and 90 percent of them fail. 
The reason, he says, is they'd write their software and find out it was full of flaws, bugs. Now, when you're just doing a spreadsheet on your PC, you may not care too much if the computer freezes a couple of times each year. But when it comes to other computer programs, you do care. If your software is to control an airplane, uh, if your software is to run a factory, if your software is to help a, uh, uh, a bank uh, manage its investments, you can't afford those sorts of errors. And yet they're just as unavoidable. And so what happens is that something is produced that cannot be put into operational use. All of which raises the question, why is it so hard to create a perfect product? Software developers give a lot of reasons. For one thing, a computer program is not a physical thing you can inspect. It's made up of directions, instructions, like a fat book of recipes for different dishes. Except all the recipes in this case are interrelated. The amount of time you're supposed to cook the omelet, let's say, may change depending on how much pepper you put on the fried potatoes. A software bug would be, it turns out when you're making a particular combination of these dishes at once, you run out of skillets, or there's no way the dishes can all be done on time. But the bug only appears in rare circumstances. It's not easy to find it unless you try every possible combination of dishes. Also, not a single comma in any recipe can be misplaced. There's one other difficulty. Suppose the people writing this cookbook had never cooked an omelet before. They didn't even have a clear idea what the steps are to making one. Janice Sharpless, who developed software for one of AT&T's telephone switches, says increasingly that's the problem software developers face. In order to realize it, you have to be able to visualize it. And I think that men, in many places we are pushing the frontier of what we know how to do with software. We don't. When you sit down and you try to string those instructions together, you just can't quite get it to work out right. It's kind of like when you write a paragraph in the book and you sit back and you read it and you go, you know, this just doesn't capture the idea that I wanted. Edsger Dykstra, who now teaches at the University of Texas, has become something of a doomsday prophet about software. He says people who should know better still underestimate the difficulty and the dangers of software. They rush ahead with new programs to fix new problems, and they end up with software that's too complicated to understand. They've forgotten the most basic rule of software, he says. You have to keep it simple. If you don't, sooner or later, you will pay the price. And uh, for, a long while, for a long time, the price will be in clumsiness, and sooner or later the price is in terms of a collapse. When it comes to many computer programs, like the air traffic control system, collapse is not acceptable. And that fact has inspired people to renew their search for tools that may finally, after 30 years of failure, make software as reliable and predictable as hardware. This is Dan Charles reporting. Tomorrow, the quest for flawless software. This is Morning Edition. I'm Bob Edwards. Most people have heard of bugs in computer software. They're usually the problem when your personal computer freezes. But software bugs can be far more disastrous than that. They have shut down telephone service in cities. And nine years ago in Texas, defective software in a hospital x-ray machine caused the machine to hit two patients with a lethal dose of radiation. The patients died. NPR's Dan Charles concludes a series on software with a report on bugs in software and possible solutions to a very dangerous problem. No 